Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Last October, it seemed that at long last, Iraq was on the verge of having a somewhat stable multi-confessional government, which will take care of the country's domestic problems, free of efforts by neighboring Iran to manipulate it. This was good news to the Biden administration because it showed that even after the end of America's military involvement, or because of it, a more democratic Iraq, which resists Iranian domination, could emerge. But these expectations were soon shattered when personal ambitions of politicians with vested interests in the status quo overshadowed by Iranian-backed militias stifled the move towards majority rule. Now there is no effective administration in Baghdad. Washington has a hands-off policy, and satisfied smiles are seen only in Tehran. To analyze developments in Iraq and Iran's role in them, joining us all the way from Washington, D.C. is Brigadier General Retired Mark Kimmett, who is the former Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Thank you for joining us, General. Certainly. Also joining us from Turkey is Mr. Omer Izkizilcik, who is a foreign policy and security analyst. Thank you for joining us as well, Omer. Thanks for having me. And uh, with us here in the studio is our TV7 editor-at-large and host of Watchmen Talk, Paris and Play, and so much more, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader understanding on the current state of play in Iraq. So, of course, there are many details and the story is still unfolding with the uh, major uh, figures in this uh, duel uh, being uh, Muqtada al-Sadr and uh, Nouri al-Maliki, the former prime minister. But there is an overall lesson, a very sad one, and that is the country of Iraq, uh, which uh, has been artificial ever since the uh, British uh, cobbled it together from various uh, districts uh, some hundred years ago, can operate under only uh, two um, possibilities tyranny and chaos. And uh, with uh, Saddam Hussein and his uh, iron grip on the country, his uh, cruel uh, dictatorship gone, and with uh, General Kimmitt's uh, former boss, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, uh, quite naively believing, believing that she can bring uh, free, fair, and full elections to Iraq, as well as to Palestine and other uh, places in the Middle East. Uh, it turns out that uh, Iraq is not the 51st state in the United States. And one, one I'm not talking right now about the political problems that the United States uh, uh, is having, but apparently they can't get uh, along, whether it's uh, Maliki, Abadi, Sadr, the various feuding Kurdish chieftains, one of whom is allied with uh, al the other uh, with Maliki. And apparently, now that the United States uh, decided uh, a few years ago already under the Obama administration uh, to leave uh, most of the area, uh, to, uh, to keep only an advisory presence there, plus the uh, embassy uh, compound which is uh, supposedly well guarded. There is no prospect of outsiders coming in to intervene, except for Iran, which is what we're going to talk about. General Kimmett, your observation? I, I think the assessment given was a bit harsh, uh, both from you and from our other guests, uh, uh, to suggest that Iran has an iron grip inside the country. I think the, this week's events would suggest otherwise. Uh, it doesn't have a lock, it does have a grip, but I think Iran is more concerned right now about the events inside of Iraq because the last thing they want on their border is a destabilized Iraq. And as regards the political system inside Iraq, certainly it's not perfect. Certainly it is not uh, uh, where anybody would like it to be, but like many countries in the region, uh, that have parliamentary systems, they go months and months uh, with caretaker governments. Now, the amount of violence this week between uh, the framework militias and Sauter's militias was uh, out of the norm and out of bounds. Uh, it is not unusual uh, in the region for caretaker governments uh, to exist for quite some period of time. 
I do a lot of work inside of Iraq, and the current caretaker government is still doing business, uh, albeit not doing business as normal this week. Indeed, Mr. Oskizilchik, I'd like to hear your take on this, and if you could also provide us some uh, clarity of which forces are currently playing within this construct of, of uh, instability. And, uh, of course, uh, we would like to have some optimism in the, or silver lining, if you will, uh, to the whole situation. Yeah, to be optimist when it comes to Iraq is always difficult. But let me try it uh, after making some elaboration. So first of all, when it comes to the Iranian perspective about Iraq and the chaos there, I don't think that the Iranians want a stabilized Iraq because a stabilized Iraq would be against the interest of Iran. A stabilized Iraq would mean a sewing country which can decide on its own, act on its own, and could act in its foreign policy and domestic policy independently. Iran wants is to maintain a certain level of destabilization in Iraq. As there's a saying uh, from the Iranians, in the Middle East, uh, the Iranians rule over chaos and the Turks rule over order. So uh, it's the Iranians who have been proven again and again that they are capable of uh, leading a chaotic environment and benefiting from a chaotic environment. So whenever we had a war or destabilization region, Iran came out of it as victorious and uh, managed to gain benefits of it. This has to do mainly with the domestic political system in Iran and the role of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards and the uh, religious ideology of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. So that being said, we have also to acknowledge that the current uh, situation in Iraq uh, and the, the caretaker government in Iraq are quite different than from uh, the versions in the European states, where some different political parties negotiate over the t uh, details of the government and have coalition talks. For instance, uh, in Israel, quite close, we have a situation that a government could not be formed for a long period. But in Iraq, it's different because weapons speak here yeah, and the differentiations and the lines are across ethnic and religious uh, separations. So therefore, uh, the take care government of Iraq is much different than from other parts of the world. And uh, to uh, react and to provide something uh, which can be positive uh, or optimistic about Iraq is we see for, uh, at the moment an intra-Shia uh, conflict and uh, dispute. So far, the Sunnis and the Kurds are relatively out of the uh, escalation and they are, uh, are pre preserving their situation. And if this escalation goes on, I think the Sunnis of Iraq may gain an op opportunity and a momentum to recover from their loss after uh, the ISIS insurgency in the country. Indeed. Mr. Oren. Two points. One, uh, General Kimmett uh, mentioned the fact that it's business as usual. Uh, the government, even though it's a caretaker government, uh, it still manages to maintain foreign investment. It still man manages to have close cooperation with multiple uh, sectors of uh, uh, civic or commercial business. And on the other hand, even though the Iranians are interested in maintaining the grip over uh, Iraq, it has also an interest to maintain certain stability at a time of instability in Iran proper. So to what degree does that go in line with the fact that uh, just several months ago we heard CIA director uh, William Burns uh, come out in one of uh, uh, his testimonies uh, highlighting that Iraq is the primary battleground between the United States and uh, uh, Iran and, and ultimately when we look within uh, that context, to what degree is that only on the surface of, of things rather than uh, proper over the central uh, government in, in Baghdad? So firstly, let me correct the impression that General Kimmett got from my uh, words previously. Uh, when I uh, said iron grip, I meant Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath party, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, what happened uh, Oh, is happening uh, with with Iran, and um, obviously Saddam uh, being Sunni, uh, with uh, the uh, Shiites um, based in the Basra area and elsewhere, but Basra being adjacent uh, to Iran and being under the influence uh, of Iran, it's a very very tough situation for a Sunni politician or even a Sunni dictator 
uh, coming from Tikrit to, to Baghdad and, and trying to uh, uh, rule over uh, the, the Shiites. Now, what happened uh, now, and, and I know this is not a perfect uh, analogy, um, Sadr used to be, uh, of course, he was anti-American, but also he was uh, considered uh, the extremist. The way Nabi Berry was in Lebanon as the head of Amal, all of a sudden when Hezbollah, um, uh, with the rise of Hezbollah in Lebanon, Nabi Berry is relatively moderate. Here too, Sadr, over the years, uh, without really changing his views, but compared to others, to the uh, popular uh, mobilization forces and other militias, is, is considered uh, moderate, at least uh, was considered last October when he managed to, to get his uh, coalition uh, ostensibly uh, in power. Now, of course, uh, they all resigned uh, following um, uh, his call and others are, are in the uh, uh, parliament. Now, Iran, because of its proximity, because geography is destiny, is always going to meddle in Iraqi affairs. And the United States, the last time around, around 2014, when it left the area, ISIS moved in to fill the vacuum. So it's very dangerous. We, we, don't, uh, we shouldn't just look at what is happening today regarding Sadr versus Maliki. Other forces could um, penetrate and change the situation. General Kemet, would you regard the current instability, if you will, in Baghdad and in Iraq at large as a intra-Shiite struggle for power, uh, as uh, we just heard also uh, uh, Ozki Zilchik uh, mention this uh, uh, ingredient within this uh, conflict, or is there more to it? No, I actually think at the present time it is primarily a intra-Shia uh, balance of power issue. It was clear that when Muqtada uh, won the elections to everyone's surprise, and had the opportunity to form the first government, just as happened with the same situation eight years previously with Ayad Alawi, Maliki and his cronies went into overdrive to try to overturn that, uh, and they did the last time, and they very well could this time. But this is not, uh, as was correctly noted, a, an issue that concerns either the Sunnis or the Kurds. This is clearly the balance of power in a government that uh, will always be led by a Shia prime minister. And so what you're seeing is battling between the forces of Muqtad al-Sadr and his Sadrist movement and those of what is known as the coalition framework, the coordinating framework of Hakim, Maliki, Hadi al-Amri, the latter being primarily the Iranian-backed organizations and the former being a nationalistic separate organization. Indeed. Well, uh, Oskar Zilchik, I'd like to hear your uh, take on this, but also beyond that. To what degree um, should we be concerned over civil war? Of course, uh, uh, the night between Monday and Tuesday uh, was a night of intense fighting, even though by light arms in uh, uh, the uh, uh, area or the compound uh, in Baghdad that houses most international embassies. Uh, we saw uh, the uh, Dutch embassy evacuate and move to the German embassy in order to intensify its uh, defensive capacity. We saw uh, the American uh, uh, embassy also fortified and, and prepared uh, uh, for multiple scenarios. Uh, is this something that uh, ultimately, of course, died down after the speech by uh, Muqtada al-Sadr, who asked uh, all of his supporters to withdraw within 60 minutes, and that was quite impressive indeed, uh, as General Kimmet said, uh, the withdrawal within, uh, just by, by a snap of his finger, able to withdraw of uh, his supporters and followers. Uh, is this going to be a trigger to potential additional violence, or are we in, in a somewhat of a safe zone at this stage? So here we have to understand that, as uh, pointed out earlier, 
that this is an inter-Shia issue, and there are also an uh, underlying religious difference in belief. So the school of Sistani and the school in uh, Iran, the 12 Imam uh, approach, is mainly differentiated in the belief regarding to the uh, religious authority. So according to the Iranian side, uh, the, to believe in the superiority and the commands of the religious authority is like believing in God himself. So it's an essential part of the religion. Why the Shias of Iraq uh, historically and traditionally do not believe in that way. So this difference in religious belief is also an underlying uh, social aspect of this intra-Shia conflict at the moment. That being said, it's not a, a clear uh, li line of division. But this is the main social religious uh, ingredient which is now fueling this conflict. So there's not only political aspects to this. And uh, second about your question of how this will develop further, we have to understand that uh, we can analyze the uh, factors and the dynamics uh, which we can see. But there is something when it comes to the Iranian Shia militia, big Shia militias and the Shia clerics and the Shia network in Iraq. This is outside of our group of uh, understanding and also to get uh, information. Uh, we don't have the information source about the very senior level of discussions between Shia clerics who make politics. And this is a close network of some Shia clerics, and they can influence policy making decisions. So here, Muqtada al-Sadr may have his own opinion, but the interference of Shia clerics can change that. And uh, it's also possible that the Shia clerics may uh, fight with each other more and not reach an uh, understanding, not reach any conclusion. And this can result in more uh, aggression and conflict on the ground. So the most of the Shias, the genuine persons, who are not aware of what's been discussed between the Shia clerics. But this is actually the essential part which will decide over if this conflict will go on, if it will increase or decrease, and how it will develop. But unfortunately, without intelligence on the discussions and debates among the Shia clerics, which we don't have, we cannot say, uh, say how this will develop. So going back to what we can see is, I do not think that the underlying dynamics are, can be resolved easily. And there is much room for more escalation in Iraq. But uh, will it, as it should be according to realistic uh, frameworks and realistic dynamics, I cannot say because of the network of Shia clerics, I don't have intelligence about. Mr. Owen? Uh, when Israel looks east, there are two buffer states between itself and Iran. The first one, of course, is the Hashabite Kingdom of Jordan, and neighboring it is Iraq. There is the old desert road and the old uh, oil pipeline going uh, from Iraq to Haifa, and the various uh, airfields are um, called H1, H2, H3, and so on, because of Haifa. And um, a couple of years ago, the Iranians tried to launch rockets or missiles at Israel from points both in eastern um, Iraq, adjacent to the uh, Iranian border. It's the same range, but Israel would not retaliate against the Iranian hinterland, but rather against uh, Iraqi territory, and western Iraq, uh, which is uh, where Saddam Hussein uh, launched his missiles from in 1991 against uh, Israel. Israel uh, successfully struck back at those sites, and they were not used um, against Israel anymore. But this is a constant threat that Israel is watching over to make sure that the Iranians are not penetrating in order to set up shop against Israel. Not to forget that there is quite a significant influence by CENTCOM also over uh, Iraq proper. And I'd like to ask you, General Kim, when we're looking uh, at Iraq as an important uh, country within the construct of the Middle East, uh, to what degree do you see this influence, this instability currently, uh, its other neighbors, including Turkey, including uh, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, Syria for that matter, uh, is this something that may trigger or fuel some spillover uh, into neighboring countries? Well, I think if you were to talk to the CENTCOM commander, he would say uh, probably not. It would appear at this point that uh, the instability is con contained within the borders of, of Iraq right now. 
if you believe that it's created primarily by external influence from Iran, uh, the very fact that we now have the Abraham Accords means that there is sort of a buffer between Iraq and the rest of the region before it affects uh, Israel. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you don't believe this is manipulated by Iran, uh, there doesn't seem to be any foreign aspirations on the part of Sadr or on the part of the coordinating framework. They see this as a strictly internal affair. Uh, listen, if you would give me one minute, I think I'd like to elaborate on the issue of uh, what is often thought of as the Combs School or the Najaf School inside of Iraq, both of the organizations here, obviously the coalition, the coordinating framework being more towards Philadelphia Key and the Qum School. But there was this belief that uh, Muqtada is aligning himself strictly with the quietists out of Najaf. And it becomes more and more apparent to many that uh, Muqtada himself may not be adhering to those beliefs of strict quietism. So it may be very much the case that instead of having quietists versus those that believe in the rule of the Supreme Leader, what you're seeing in Iraq is the forces of those who believe in the Supreme Leader versus the force of those who believe in a religious authority having more influence on politics. So either Elia Tafaki de facto or Velia Tafaki de jour, uh, but certainly not uh, advances for a sectarian government, uh, excuse me, of a, a secular government. Indeed. Well, uh, Mr. Oskizinchik, would you agree with that also? And, and if you could provide your intake on that uh, from a Turkish perspective, to what degree is Turkey, which is a neighbor, of course, of Iran, it has its own interests in north uh, uh, western Iran, concerns of its own, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the PKK and uh, the uh, PKK today is, of course, also aligned with uh, the uh, Hashti Shabi or the Popular Mobilization Forces directives that uh, have come from uh, Tehran, have even put uh, the, the uh, uh, Popular Mobilization Forces in a course of collision uh, with uh, the Turkish military operating in northwestern uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, is this something that also has become part of the calculus, if you will, within this uh, context? So we have to say that when the elections uh, results came in, there was uh, this thing that the Turkish supported uh, Sunni parties and the Kurdish parties had a huge important electoral uh, victory. So the uh, Kurdistan Democratic Party, as well as the Sunni parties in Iraq, have won quite uh, some of the uh, seats at the parliament. And there was uh, this undertone of Turkey actually trying to bring the Sunni parties together and to facilitate some uh, mediation between them and to bring them onto the same side of the table and to underline the common interests of Sunni political parties. But uh, this uh, was on the political and diplomatic side. But in Iraq, there is also a military side of everything. And in Iraq, unfortunately, uh, political aspects are being debated not with words but with weapons sometimes and this is a huge issue so at the moment Turkey does not play any role in this military uh, rivalry inside Iraq but Turkey is focused on the fight against the PKK and here Iran sees the PKK as a bulwark and uh, obstacle for Turkey to be more influential in the south or in the middle of Iraq, in the west of Iraq, and to play a greater role. So what Iran is actually trying to do is to keep out the Turks via the PKK out of Iraq and the Israelis uh, via Syria and Hezbollah out of Iraq and the Arab states as well. So this approach from, uh, from Iranian side is trying to underline that Iran should be the major role and everyone else should be focused on something else while Iran is doing its own thing inside uh, its neighbor, the neighboring country of Iraq. So unfortunately, during the fight against ISIS, we have seen that Iran gained much more of a leverage inside I Iraq and that Iranian militias have been legitimized to the concerns of Turkey. And now these Iranian militias have been bombed, uh, bombed Turkish military bases inside Iraq and have repeatedly threatened the Turkish public with uh, attacks. So this threat and this military uh, actions by Iranian militias towards Turkey 
underlines again that to limit Iran inside Iraq is a common interest for all. But unfortunately, here we have the Kurds, we have the Shias and the Sunnis, but among all, there is no balance between them. The Kurds are playing their own game in their administration, uh, autonomous administrations, and the Sunnis have become so much weakened that they have only a political and a social role. On the military level, the Sunnis are very weak if they don't have even a real power. And in the Iraqi army itself, uh, is not a part of this political debate, unfortunately. So when it comes to weapons speaking, the political aspects, it are the militias who have to stay on the ground. And here mm -hmm. to uh, establish balance, we would need to uh, work on the Sunnis in Iraq. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program. I'd like to uh, give uh, General Kimmett still the opportunity to uh, provide some additional silver lining, uh, considering you're often, of course, also in Iraq and uh, you know the dynamics from within. Uh, Within 40 seconds, uh, give or take, General Kimmett, uh, where are we heading from here? Well, first of all, there's very little uh, silver lining inside of Iraq. I'm just suggesting that it's not a failed or failing state. Mm -hmm. It has a tendency to brew. Uh, well, the fact that weapons were used the other night, uh, this week, uh, indicates that there are some flaws inside the political system. But just as quickly as weapons are pulled out, they're also put back in. Uh, these are more being used uh, as intimidation devices, not truly really for civil war. Uh, I would think what we're going to see, if in fact this uh, temporary ceasefire holds among the warring parties, uh, that the government will take very close analysis of what happened on the ground, and perhaps this might be the uh, the levers that was needed to finally resolve this political situation, because we can see. The worst thing that happens is if it's not solved, there will be more violence. Indeed. So this could actually be a catalyst for the solution to this uh, deadlock that we're seeing in the politics. Well, considering the situation, we will revisit this topic in the near future. So I'd like to thank General Kimmet, uh, Mr. Oskizilchik, and Mr. Owen for being part of today's panel. And I'd like also to thank our viewers, and we will see you next time.